It's Tuesday, March 15th, 2022, and I call this meeting of the House Higher Education Committee to order. The CLA will take the roll. Chair Bernardi. Present. Bernardi, present. Vice Chair Christensen. Present. Christensen, present. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Representative Albright. Representative Albright. Albright, present. Albright, present. Representative Daniels. Daniels, present. Daniels, present. Representative Erickson. Erickson, present. Erickson, present. Representative Hansen. Hansen, present. Hansen, present. Representative Heinzeman. Present. Heinzeman, present. Representative Howard. Representative Howard. Representative Keeler. Keeler present. Keeler present. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn present. Cleborn present. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick present. Kosnick present. Representative Creshaw is excused. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason present. Representative Meckland. Meckland present. Meckland, present. Representative Noor. Noor, present. Noor, present. Representative Sandell. Representative Sandell. Representative Sandstead. Sandstead, present. Sandstead, present. Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson. Representative Howard. Present. Howard, present. Representative Sandell. Representative Thompson. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you very much. Next, may I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 9th, 2022? So moved, Madam Chair. The Representative Stansted moves approval of the minutes for March 9th, 2022. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion prevails and the minutes for March 9th, 2022 are approved. First on the agenda, we have Senate file 3372. We have 40 minutes scheduled for this bill and we will wrap up and vote at 345. Senate, uh, Senate file 303072 has passed the Senate and the House has given it its first reading and referred it to this committee. This bill is a companion to House file 36. Three, which we will lay aside. I will move that Senate file 3372 be referred to Ways and Means. We have before us Senate file 3372. Representative Listigar, Lis, Lislagard has an author's amendment labeled A1. I will move the A1 amendment to put the bill in the form that the author wants. Representative Lis, Lislagard, can you tell us uh, briefly about your amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. So um, when this bill came over from the Senate, it kind of uh, brought in the two separate bills. And uh, we think it's imperative that we expedite this. And uh, we do not want um, um, to have to stop at multiple committees. So that is why we are pulling out um, that amendment uh, for the 5 million. And we will um, continue to work to make sure that we provide um, the 5 million for the caregivers, but we did not want this um, to be stopped um, in, in, in stuck in committee. We would like to move this to Ways and Means, and then we would like to move it to the House floor um, as fast as we can. Is there any discussion? Thank you, Representative Lissagard. Is there any discussion to the amendment? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Representative Liz Lagarde, welcome to the committee. Please present your bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm sitting here with a colleague of ours and a friend, and uh, we are asking for your support. Uh, on this bill appropriating $20 million towards ALS research to speed us along the path to finding a cure for the disease that has devastated my friend, Senator Thomasoni, 
and so many others. While I'm here as a legislator, I'm also here before you as a friend, like so many that um, struggle to understand the, uh, the impacts that this disease, devastating disease, has not only on the patient, but also the family. And I'm here with Senator Tomasoni to help make sure that we find a cure that some, at some point in the future, no Minnesotan needs to wonder about the effects of ALS. ALS is always a fatal disease in which a person's brain loses connection with its muscles. People with ALS lose their ability to walk, talk, eat, and eventually breathe. ALS usually strikes people between the ages of 40 and 70, but it can strike anyone at any time. In Minnesota, there's an average of 450 people living with ALS at any one time. Although there is not a cure or a treatment that halts ALS, scientists have made significant progress in understanding what causes it. One example of this is the Haley Platform trial that is currently being tried at the Mayo University of Minnesota and Essential Health in Duluth. This new way of doing research will speed up the drug development by reducing the cost of research by 30% and decreasing the trial time by 50%. But it will take, it will take and require ongoing funding to see these drug trials through. This bill aims to continue to push research forward with $20 million dedicated to ALS research in Minnesota. We can see some of these preliminary trials enhanced. We could better understand how and why ALS, ALS impacts people and move towards finding an effective treatment and ultimately and hopefully a cure. ALS does not have to be a, a fatal disease it could help make the disease, excuse me, this bill could help, ma uh, help make it a disease that people can live with. People with ALS truly deserve that. I didn't understand it at the time, but as I watched my dear friend um, go through this, it has been extremely hard for me personally. Um, I wanna say that I think that there was a, a picture that was uh, sent around and I want to put that in perspective for you. As I'm sitting next to my friend, as he is being a champion for this, this, I don't even want to call it a cause, a cure for something that impacts and devastates not only patients, but the family. He's always been here for me. Um, Senator Tomasoni, that's my daughter. Um, and she was in third grade with Senator Wellstone when I lost my job at LTV, 1400 people lost their job at that time. And Senator Tomasoni has been with us every step of the way. He's just not my Senator. He's my friend and he's a friend of the Iron Range. And we are so blessed to have him here with us today. And uh, Madam Chair, if uh, you're okay with it, Senator Tomasoni would like to say a few words. Um, and I wanna to explain to people um, how he's able to do that. With the new technology, uh, he's got a computer here and I've watched him um, work on his statement. And he types in these words and it takes him a period of time, but um, he has some, has some comments for the committee. And if you're okay with that, um, Madam Chair, if Senator Tomasoni could say a few words. That would be wonderful. And welcome to the committee, Chair Tomasoni. I want to let you know what it's an honor. It is serving as the House Higher Education Chair with you being the chair in the Senate. And uh, we've spanned over two decades of uh, friendship here. And I want to thank you for how, you know, we got our jobs done and we worked together and we came up with a really good bill for higher ed. And I want to thank you for your spirit and collaboration and partnership. And it's an honor to be a part of that with you. So thank you, Chair Tomasoni. And please proceed with your testimony and welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, thank you for hearing this bill and thank you to Representative Lisselgard for carrying the bill. Thank you also to Speaker Hortman and the numerous co-authors, members, Lou Gehrig died of ALS in 1939. Little to no progress in finding a cure has been made since. 
This bill is a concerted effort to find a cure for ALS. ALS is a neurological disease that saps the strength from muscles and ultimately leaves chaos in its wake. In September, I was still driving and able to dress and feed myself. Today, I can't do any of them. The disease progresses differently in different people. Hopefully, this bill will go a long way to finding a permanent stop to any progression whatsoever. It may not happen in my lifetime, but the future needs to be full of hope that next generations will be ALS free. Thanks to my Senate colleagues for the unanimous support. Hopefully we will have the same results in the House of Representatives. I would be remiss if I didn't thank everyone who has given all their support to me and my family all along the way. Thank you committee members and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Thomasoni, for your testimony and it's an honor to have you here with us today. And uh, thank you, uh, Representative Lisklagard, for bringing this bill before us. You have a number of people who would like to testify today and uh, would you like to start with Marianne Hewen? Uh, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Marianne Hewen. Please state your name for the record and proceed. And before we do that, I see we have a hand raised. Uh, Representative Albright, did you have a question? Or are you anticipating you have a question? Madam Chair, I'll hold my comments until after testimony. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 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 Marianne Kewen, welcome to the committee and please say your name and start your uh, yeah. testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Mary Ann Kewen. I am the Vice President of Care Services for the ALS Association here in Minnesota, obviously here today to ask for your support of this bill. Um, I would like to start by just sharing some facts about ALS. You've heard some already, but it is a progressive disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. Two people every week are diagnosed in Minnesota and two people every week die from this disease every week in Minnesota. The average life expectancy of somebody diagnosed is two to five years. The reason why this bill is so important is that 90% of those diagnosed have no known causes. We simply have not had the research put into it to figure that out. Veterans are also two times more likely to be diagnosed with ALS, again, for unknown reasons. I wanted to share a little bit about um, caregiver burden related to ALS. Uh, so we conducted a survey uh, in August of 2021 where we polled caregivers who had a loved one with ALS at home. And I just wanted to share these statistics with you um, because I think they're telling. 68% of caregivers said they spent more than 30 hours a week providing care. 50% felt unprepared providing that care. 52% cited worries about their future. 56% worried about the lack of time that they themselves had to take care. 44% also cited dealing with depression. One of the things that I found um, probably the most compelling was a separate report we did where we uh, talked to families who had young children, so ages eight to 18, um, and also had a family member, often a parent who is living with ALS. And what we found is that those children spent an average of five hours a day, five hours a day as a child, providing that care to their parent. We also know that some children postpone or choose to forego entirely post-secondary education so that they can stay home and care for their parent because the needs are so intense. We, we also know that many of these caregivers, oftentimes the spouses, end up having to leave their own jobs to provide care for their loved one because the financial burden of finding enough additional caregiving support is simply too much for them to handle. ALS was discovered over 150 years ago, and yet there are still only two treatments approved that will slow the progression of the disease. And you'll hear from Dr. Walk in a little bit about some of the research on the horizon. Um, and the truth is we've seen the benefits that an infusion of research funding can bring. In 2014, we, the ice bucket challenge hit um, and 
it was tremendous. And in that time, we started to see a change. Since then, we know progress has been made. Five new genes have been discovered, three new antisense drugs have been developed, and several other ALS therapies are in the final stages of clinical trials. And this is simply because people took the opportunity to make a difference in funding ALS research. The funding in this bill would be trans transformational in terms of the research that could be conducted and the support that is needed for families impacted by this disease. People living with ALS don't have the luxury of waiting. So we're asking for your support uh, so we can continue to provide for these families and continue to drive research forward towards more effective treatments and ultimately a cure. We know these will be hugely beneficial and we thank you so much for taking the time to hear these bills today. And uh, I am here for any questions that you may have as, as this progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have with us Dr. David Wach from the University of Minnesota Medical School. Welcome to the committee and please state your name and proceed. Madam Chair, committee members for the record, my name is David Wach. I'm head of the Neuromuscular Medicine Division in the Department of Neurology at the University of Minnesota Medical School and the medical director of the M Health Fairview ALS Certified Treatment Center of Excellence. I accepted a faculty position at the University of Minnesota over 20 years ago because it provided an opportunity to work at a major research university with broad and deep resources in all areas of biomedical science and to work with nationally recognized leaders in neuromuscular care. Thanks to the support of the people of Minnesota, our medical school is a recognized leader in scientific advances to treat neurologic disorders. Our ALS team has studied brain neurochemistry, spinal cord degeneration, and novel treatments for ALS. We've pioneered a large data set for clinical trial development, designed clinical trials, and led an effort to conduct ALS clinical trials collaboratively across health systems. I've been asked to testify today about the impact of this legislation. This legislation can be transformative. In recent years, scientists have identified several molecular problems that may be treatable root causes of ALS. Used effectively, the legislation before you today is an opportunity to translate basic scientific discoveries into treatments for ALS. The path to success is a coordinated team approach to translate the most promising scientific discoveries into treatments. Successful teams include physician scientists who understand the human impact of the disease, partnering with scientists in the fields of molecular biology, disease modeling, and drug development. This funding is sufficient to bring outstanding scientists to the fight against ALS. New discoveries will lead to clinical trials designed to determine what works best to stop ALS. To this end, health providers throughout the state must work together to facilitate access to clinical trials to as many interested Minnesotans as possible, regardless of their background, personal circumstances, or geographic location. Finally, we also need to expand research and medical devices that remove barriers in daily life for people living with ALS and other physical challenges. Working alongside established programs of clinical research and care, and with the courageous partnership of people living with ALS and their families, Wise stewardship of funds provided in this legislation can translate discoveries into treatments that will improve and extend the lives of people living with ALS. All Minnesotans owe a debt of gratitude to Senator Thomasoni for his extraordinary commitment to helping others. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of this legislation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Walk. With, with us, we have, and we'll take questions at the, um, at the end. We have with us today, Kent Herbeck. Please state your name and uh, begin your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, Kent Herbeck, um, Minnesota resident. Uh, as I know a lot of people you know, I played baseball for the Minnesota Twins for 14 seasons. And and uh, have been pretty well known for my work and and trying to find a cure or help raise funds for ALS in, in Minnesota and around the country. I guess uh, I've been to a 
couple of different things out in Washington at different times uh, for different bills that have been trying to get passed out there as well. So um, I'm here with my testimony just to uh, give you my background and, and uh, uh, the, the stuff that we've done in Minnesota uh, with different golf tournaments, fishing tournaments, snowmobile rides. The amount of money we've raised in Minnesota is probably unmatched by no other state in the country. Maybe New York might have might have raised more money than us, but uh, for uh, our little Midwestern state, we've done a fantastic job with with raising funds for ALS. And uh, when you talk about ALS in Minnesota, people know what you're talking about because of the great job that a lot of people have done um, with Marianne and, and the people at the ALS Association, which we started up back in 1996 and uh, all the different uh, different walks, fundraising walks and this and that. The, the, when we first heard about this bill by Senator Tomasoni, it was, uh, it was an unbelievable thing that we could think about getting that kind of money sent towards this, this disease and to try to get this disease stopped somehow. My father was diagnosed back in 1981 and uh, um, that was when I was first starting my career with the twins and, and, uh, and being such a, and I had such a high myself and then hearing my father had ALS and, and um, he passed away in 1982. He did get to see me play, but he had passed along to me to, uh, to make sure that uh, I fought this battle and, and I have since that day. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm fighting for him and for everybody else uh, that has been uh, diagnosed or had anything to do with ALS. And when I heard about Senator Tomasoni's bill, I, I wanted to help any way I could and, and testify for whatever and help out in any way I could. So here I am today and, and I want to thank everybody for, for listening. Madam Chair and, and the committee members, uh, what, a, what a wonderful bill this is. And, and hopefully we can get this passed and, and be a, a spearhead into finding and hopefully finding a cure, but also helping people with ALS at this time. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Walk as well for, for coming tonight and uh, to this afternoon and, and giving his professionalism on the uh, on ALS. So thank you very much. And I'll definitely hang around if there's any questions later on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Herbeck. And I'm um, sure your dad is very proud of you for trying to make a difference in so many people's lives. So. Thank you. I know we, we are proud of you being our um, Minnesota twin in our community and uh, you're still here advocating for us. So thank you very much. With us, we have Terry Steinbach. Uh, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and proceed your testimony. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, Mr. Steinbach, you're on mute. There you go. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, there you go. Okay, it's my Start first over. one. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, my story, uh, 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 full-time Minnesota resident. Um, I played out in uh, Oakland for uh, 11 years and then came to Minnesota and joined the Twins for the last three of my career. So Herbie and I were adversaries on the field. We had many fun battles, and I'm sure many of you people uh, watching today saw the battles that we had. Uh, I'm going to say, unfortunately, um, I got to work with Kent in this ALS battle. In 1999, uh, my dad uh, passed away of ALS. And just like um, Herbie was saying, um, it, it goes pretty quick. And here I am, you know, pro ball player playing for, for, for the Twins in, in 98, living every, everybody's dream. And yet I'm calling home you know, to see how he's doing. I'm getting the reports, you know, from my mom and my brothers that dad's not doing well. And then you get that call in 99 that he had passed. And I was in Cleveland at the time. So, you know, you, you fly home and you do what you have to do. Um, and one of the first guys I saw at the funeral was Herbie, you know, and I'll never forget that. And what I started doing is I got involved with uh, the Blackwood Blizzard Tour, the snowmobile ride that Ken kind of talked about, uh, Never Surrender Inc. And in uh, 23 years, we've raised eight, $18 million. And the only reason I bring that up, it took us 23, 23 years to, to raise that. So when Senator Tomasoni uh, presented this bill, and we have the opportunity to raise $20 million today, I mean, literally with a stroke of some pens, I'm assuming 
um, we were, oh man, we were extremely excited about it. Um, we know that this disease, you know, what it does, um, again, with my dad, I think the ALS Association, that was the only help we had. Um, there wasn't medication back then. There wasn't much that we could do. And with the potential monies that we get, the uh, research that can be done, the Healy platform that was mentioned earlier, the availability of potentially life-altering drugs that can come out of that. And the thing we need to get that done, you know, is money. And to see this potential bill is, I know, extremely exciting, you know, for me. And, and, and I know, you know, Herbie with our fishing tournaments and our snowmobile rides and, and, and golf tournaments, we're, we're going to continue to do on our part because eventually, eventually we want to see a cure for this thing. Um, we don't want to have these meetings here anymore. You know, we want to have a, a thing that it's done and it would be great if the passing of this bill would be a, a, a leapfrog into some awesome developments that the, I'm sure the doctor you know, has, has, has talked about. So again, thank you for letting me uh, you know, be on this Zoom with you. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to hear my story. Madam and, and committee members, thanks again. Thank you very much, Mr. Steinbach. And uh, we're proud of you being a twin as well and for all the work you've done to advocate for a cure for ALS and for the fundraising you've done. So thank you for being here today. With us now, we have Chris Engler. Please um, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chair, this is uh, Phil Griffin. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Engler is not able to be with us today. Um, he has been uh, going to Mayo Clinic for treatment and is actually going through uh, a treatment today. And since his regrets, um, he has supplied uh, to the committee uh, written testimony in support of this. Uh, Mr. Engler, as many of you may know, um, had a very successful NBA basketball career after uh, being a Minnesota Gopher, and uh, people like me had a chance to see him playing at Williams Arena uh, for a, a number of times. Um, I won't go into uh, detail with it, but I can assure you that his written testimony asks that we support very strongly this legislation, and he is happy to do anything he can to help usher it on his way. Um, Madam Chair, thank you for letting me interrupt here briefly. Uh, Phil Griffin representing the LS chapter here in Minnesota. Well, thank you, Mr. Griffin, and please send our um, regards to Mr. Engler. And said we, we're sad that he wasn't able to be here today. We hope that his, his health is um, he's making some improvements and getting the care that he needs. Uh, we have represented them now. We have, um, we have two more testifiers, I believe. And I had last minute testifier named, um, I got Z Zykina. And I am going to look to see if she is here. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I believe she's testifying on the on the next bill. On the next bill. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So then we do have one more testifier today, and that is our very own here in the Minnesota House, Representative Ann New Brindley. Welcome to our committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll try to be brief because obviously um, many things have already been covered. And uh, but I'm here before the committee testifying as a citizen who is um, really excited to see this get done. Um, I mentioned this, we held a press conference a couple of weeks ago and I mentioned this there. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to wait until issues are ripe um, for them to be dealt with legislatively. And um, it makes me very sad that we are here today with our friend, um, David Tomasoni, um, but his diagnosis and his experience makes this issue right for us and it brings it really to the forefront for all of us. And so I am sorry to my friend um, that this is why we're here, but I'm sure grateful for what you're doing with this opportunity. So thank you for that. Um, and, and as we know, and as has been stated, only about 450 people are living with ALS at any given time in the state of Minnesota. Um, which makes it a, a very quiet disease that a lot of people are not being exposed to regularly, which means that it just doesn't get the attention and funding that other illnesses get, which has, has led us to the place that we are now. And right now we are in a place that when you receive a diagnosis for ALS, you know the end from the beginning. You know exactly what the process is going to be and, and how your body is going to be affected. 
Um, and so I just want to thank um, Senator Tomasoni and Representative Liz Lagarde for doing this. I know um, in August of 2013, my late husband, John, was diagnosed with ALS. And at that time, our youngest daughter was five years old. And because you know the end from the beginning, we had to sit our kids down um, from five to 12 years old and talk to them exactly about what was going to happen because we certainly didn't want surprises. Um, and we went through what happens, you know, uh, it's going to get hard for dad to walk. Um, it's going to get hard for dad to eat at some point. And he's going to have a tube <laughs> coming out of his stomach where we're going to make sure that he has the nourishment that he needs through this tube. Um, at some point, it's going to get really difficult for him to talk and he's going to have a special computer that he can talk to us through. And, and, and John did that. He had an eye gaze computer and he did amazing things communicating with people through his eyes. Um, eventually, it's dad's not gonna be able to breathe anymore and he's probably gonna have a tube. <laughs> of course, we're talking to small children, a tube um, in his throat that's gonna help him breathe and he's gonna have machines that breathe for him. But we were very honest with our young children and saying, and eventually, dad's body is not going to work anymore. It's just not going to work anymore. Um, and, and having those conversations with your very young children is exactly why we need to pass this legislation. <laughs> Families need hope. And right now that hope um, just isn't there. That hope just isn't there. This is a disease that has lived in the shadows because of the very few people who are afflicted um, and yet it's devastating. It's devastating for those who are affected um, and uh, it's, it's time. Again, it makes me very sad that we're here because of our friend, but I'm so grateful that he is using this opportunity to make a difference. Um, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge was something that provided a lot of hope in 2014. Uh, but it was it was a flash in the pan. That's the kind of thing that you can't recreate. And so while a ton of resources were infused into the space at that time, we haven't been able to maintain that. And uh, so we, we need this kind of funding to move forward. Right now, the only, um, the only definitive treatment is really Zoll, and it literally extends life a matter of uh, a few months. That's the treatment for ALS. It might give you a few extra months in your two to five years. It's, it's, it's virtually non-existent. I mean, it's kind of funny that we even talk about it as a treatment for ALS. Um, the, the benefit is so minimal. Uh, most of the medications are for, are for symptoms. You treat symptoms. Um, so again, I just wanna say thank you to Representative Liz Lagarde and Senator Tomasoni for doing this. Um, and my, my um, sincere request to the committee is that you view this as an opportunity, one that is sometimes difficult, um, but we have, we have an opportunity to make a difference in a space that, uh, that needs the resources, that just doesn't, hasn't had them in the past. We just don't have the resources in this space and we need them. So thank you, Madam Chair and members for listening. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. Now, uh, I do not have any other public testifiers listed. Representative Lissagar, do you have any more testifiers? Um, no, I don't. But uh, if I could, Madam Chair, I would like to uh, maybe, you know, I want to acknowledge um, Representative Albright, who, uh, as I was trying to understand this um, disease and understand this, um, this process, um, Representative Albright um, really helped me. And uh, I can't thank him enough um, for him taking the time. And uh, he's dear friends with uh, um, Senator Thomas Sony. So he, uh, he took it upon himself to help me through that process. And I, and I greatly appreciate that. I also would like to note that, um, you know, Representative Sandstead and David and I, um, we lost um, a dear friend um, to labor, to um, the Iron Range, um, that was diagnosed after Senator Tomasoni, and his name was um, Dennis Frazier. And uh, yesterday uh, we had a funeral for him. 
And, you know, when you just see this, and Senator Tomasoni had mentioned it, um, you don't know how it affects. It affects people in different ways in that time frame. And so time is, uh, is of an essence for us to move this forward. And uh, I would appreciate everyone's support. Okay, well, I, I don't want to let members know that we don't have any further public testifiers listed, but I will note that members have received written testimony, which is in their packets, and posted to the committee website. Now, I see I have, um, we can now go into discussion, and we have Representative Albright with his eager hand up there. So please proceed, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wish, I wish we weren't here talking about this issue today. I wish we weren't even talking about this bill. But we are. And for Minnesota, this bill represents a call to arms. And my senator, dear friend Tom Sony, is leading that charge. When I first heard about this, I knew two people that I had to call right away. Jacob Tolar. and Andre Terzik. This state owes so much to our medical professions for figuring out the mysteries of life. This is no less of a challenge but Minnesota is up to the task. This funding is no less than the catalyst for what I believe will be another means of identifying Minnesota as the preeminent medical state for discovering that which is the scourge of our societies. It's often said that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Senator Tomasoni, you are one of those giants. It was said in testimony that was given by another dear friend of mine, Senator Anu Brindley, excuse me. This provides hope. Senator Thomas Oni, you are that hope. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Albright. Uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde and, and everybody who's talked in this space. Um, <clears throat> one thing I wanna point out is how quick this changes lives. Um, I think we've heard that in these messages. And I mean, like, literally, I think I, I heard that uh, Senator Thomasoni was driving and functionable really well in September. And now we're here months later and, and this has been changed. What I wanna point out to the people who are listening and watching this is that as legislators, we're often divided in a lot of things, but at the end of the day, we love and we care about the people of Minnesota. And what you're seeing here is us collectively taking down our walls and choosing to work together to care in a space full of compassion for our future generation. This is going to be a long-term effort that we continuously have to show up together for. And I just wanna say in this space, I appreciate the vulnerability because I think Minnesota sees us in a lot of spaces that we're arguing, that we're pulling each other apart. And in this space, what we're doing is we're taking the pain that we all feel and find a purpose to move forward and to find a way to invest in our next generations. And so um, as a freshman in this space, it's actually really humbling to see us do this. And I just wanna recognize that the importance of coming together and supporting each other as humans in this work. Um, and I appreciate all of you sharing your personal stories because again, it humanizes us in what we're doing here. Um, and I absolutely think that we need to invest in this for the future of Minnesotans um, and, and generations to come. So I, I just appreciate this conversation very much um, and look forward to supporting this effort moving forward. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Thomas Odey, uh, Representative Lewick and I wanted to tell you how much we love you, how much we appreciate you. Uh, we were just reminiscing about how lucky we are and fortunate to, can, to have a, a friendship with you that started a long time ago, quite honestly, about the moment we walked into St. Paul. You're one of those people that is always there, kind and happy and positive, even though it can be so divisive. And what a legacy. We're so blessed to be able to count you as a friend and support this legislation and look forward to seeing you at every opportunity. And thank you for that. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. Years ago, I had a friend who also had ALS. And again, what it does to that person, what it does to the family, the friends, it's, it's, it really is very, very difficult to watch. And well, fortunately, she said, there may not be a lot of people, but you just have to know one person and the impact it has on their family, their friends. So again, I'm thinking, you know, to be able to do this is just huge. So thank you to everybody and thank you for sharing. Thank you, Representative Mason. I do not see any further hands. I am going to just make a couple comments here and then have David do the wrap up here. But um, I wanted to thank, again, I said it a little bit at the beginning, but um, Senator, well, Chair Thomasoni, again, it's been an honor to know you for uh, a few decades. It's it's spanned since 2000, since we've known each other and um, serving as a higher ed chair with you and doing really good for Minnesota students. The fostering grant um, that we did as part of this committee and Teacher of Color Act and teacher shortage areas and your supplemental um, funding for greater Minnesota schools. There's The list just goes on. And, you know, I hope that what I want to carry with me, and I hope that everybody in this body, well, before they, before they do a snarky comment, a mean intended comment, a um, just just not 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 being a good person, that they'll they'll pause and say, what would David do? And you know, we never got 
any of those snarky comments or any of those meanness out of you. You have been a person that has um, engaged with people and cares about people and um, really makes this place a great place to work and get thing, a lot of good things done in the state of Minnesota for, for the people. And you have been a leader in that and the opportunity to know you as a friend and now serve with you as a leader um, on higher education. I am grateful to you and I'm looking forward to um, the rest of our work this session that we continue to work together. Um, you are your amazing person and thank you so much for um, this bill and for helping um, all the other people suffering with ALS and hopefully preventing and having a cure and all the families. So thank you very, very much. And with that, uh, Representative Lisa Gard, you will get the closing remarks here. Or Rep uh, Chair Tomasoni, would you like to have some closing remarks as well? I should have asked that. No, um, my apologies. Uh, so this um, Senator Tomasoni uses his eyes. And so if you see me looking over here, he writes stuff and um, he, he says the honor is truly mine. Yeah. and that he loves each and every one of you and asks for you for your support. And I can't say anything better than that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Tomasoni and Representative Liz Lagarde. Okay, with, with hearing no further discussion, I will renew my motion that House File 4220 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I just want to make sure before we go on, oh, that is not the bill. That's why I was like, this is not right. This is a Senate file. We're going to back up here. Hearing no further discussion, I'll renew my motion that Senate file 3372 be referred to ways and means. <laughs> the CLA will take the role. Chair Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Vice Chair Christensen. Aye. Christensen, aye. Representative O'Neill. Absolutely. Yes. O'Neill, aye. Representative Albright. I love you, my friend. Albright, aye. Representative Daniels. That's a yes for Daniels. Daniels, aye. Representative Erickson. Uh, Erickson votes aye. Erickson, aye. Representative Hansen. Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Heinzeman. Heinzeman, yes. Heinzeman, aye. Representative Howard. Howard, aye. Howard, aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn, aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Creshaw is excused. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, Aye. Representative Meckland. Meckland, absolutely yes. Meckland, aye. Representative Noor. Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Sandell is excused. Representative Sandstead. Sandstead, absolutely yes. Sandstead, aye. Representative Thompson. Representative Thompson. Madam Chair, there are 16 ayes. There being 16 ayes and zero nays, the motion passes and Senate file 3372 as amended is referred to ways and means. Thank you, Madam Chair members. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> you are welcome. Love to you and hugs. And I know that might not be appropriate here, but we're sending them anyway. <laughs> it's, he says it's 100% okay. He loves you I'm, guys too. Thank you. Right. Bye, Chair. Bye, uh, bye, Chair Thomasoni and Representative Liz, Liz, Liz Lagarde. Take care. Okay, and thank you for all of our testifiers today on that bill. With us now, we are going to be moving on to our next bill on the agenda, and we have House File 4220 from Representative Cleveland. We have uh, about 15 to 20 minutes scheduled for this bill, and we will plan to wrap up around 
4405. If I need to go a little bit over, we can, but I will move that House Bill 4220 be laid over for possible inclusion. So we have before us House Bill 4220. Representative Cleveland, please present your bill to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the bill is actually pretty simple and very straightforward. It uh, is for the Minnesota State College campuses, and the bill is for counselor support. It would say that each two-year college must employ full-time faculty counselors whose primary assignment is counselor duties. Um, it uh, also has a requirement of one counselor for every 750 students or if the campus is smaller than that, one counselor per campus. Um, we heard in testimony earlier this year, so I won't go into great deal, detail, but we've lost about 55% of our counselors over the last 15 years. And that leaves many of our campuses without counselors while the need has increased. And uh, this need preceded the pandemic. And the, the last two years have certainly exacerbated the situation. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm just going to ask that we move on to our testifiers. If you would please, I believe that Mr. Grant is up first. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cleveland. And welcome to the committee, Mark Grant. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Bernardi. For the record, my name is Mark Grant. Uh, I'm a communication studies instructor at Dakota County Technical College, and I currently am on assignment helping direct the governmental relations work on, on behalf of uh, Minnesota State College faculty. Chair Bernardi, Vice Chair Christensen, Ranking Member O'Neill, Committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I would very much like to thank Representative Cleveland for recognizing the, the scope of the issue and bringing forward uh, this bill. This is a bill that, address, that directly addresses the critical need for counselors on our campuses. Um, I do want to reserve the bulk of the time for, for our, our knowledgeable testifiers and, and Representative Cleveland uh, laid the, the groundwork and, and gave the context, uh, I think, beautifully. Um, this is, in fact, something that predates the pandemic. Uh, we would argue that uh, the simultaneous uh, 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 growing needs of our students, right, because over the, over the last 15 years, um, our open enrollment institutions have been seeing the needs of students, uh, many, for, many of them are first generation college students, we've seen those needs grow. And at the time we've seen their needs grow, that's the exact same time that we have seen uh, uh, the presence of our faculty counselors on campus uh, diminish significantly. And we would argue certainly uh, correlation is not causation, but I think that those two simultaneous factors play a huge role in why we find ourselves in the position that we find ourselves in right now, which is having a statewide conversation about the mental health care needs of our students across all levels of, of uh, education. Um, the need is great, no doubt, and I know that you've been hearing a lot of opinions as to what approach we need to take in order to meet those needs. Uh, I would simply argue that the passage of, of House File 4220 uh, would result in resources directed where they will by far have the greatest impact, and that is on our campuses uh, with our students. So with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Leanne Schmidt. Uh, she's a counselor in our system and can share with you her, um, her expertise. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Welcome to the committee, Leanne Schmidt. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Leanne Schmidt, and I'm a counselor at Inver Hills Community College. Um, I'm a nationally certified uh, board certified counselor and a licensed professional counselor and licensed supervisor in the state of Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity um, for us to speak with you today. I have been a community college counselor um, for almost 30 years, and this is the first time in my career that I can remember mental health being a priority in, uh, on a local, state, and national level. Chancellor Mulhautra, uh, Governor Waltz, and President Biden have all cited mental health student concerns as a crisis and a primary focus. And we feel that this is the time to be bold and commit to the support that our students need. I wanted to share why we think faculty counselors are the way to do this and how this bill will help us get there. Over the past 20 years, we've seen a significant reduction in counselors on campuses, and some of our campuses have no counselors. There are a variety of factors leading up to these changes, including enrollment challenges, changing leadership, and changing priorities and models. Among concerns with reducing counselors is the fact that wait times to see an insurance eligible therapist in the community is at around six months at this point, and rural communities have even more difficulty accessing services. Having counselors on campus essentially takes away that barrier to our students receiving the mental health counseling that they need. Minnesota State College faculty counselors are uniquely qualified to provide mental health counseling and comprehensive support for our college students. 
community and technical college counselors meet um, all meet Min State's minimum qualifications to provide professional counseling services to students. We provide a holistic model of counseling because we have the ability to assist students with mental health, career, and academic counseling needs. Our two-year campuses are open access institutions, and we are primarily computer, commuter campuses, um, and students don't have the time, energy, or resources to visit three or four offices to get the support that they need. Often it's an academic issue that brings a student in to see us, and it's then that we uncover mental health issues that are underlying the concerns about their ability to be successful or a lack of resources that are making it challenging for a student to focus on school because they don't know how they're going to be able to provide the next meal for their family. Our counselors help students who need housing or food support to get connected with those basic needs. In terms of academic support, when students are struggling, we understand those student programs, what stopping out might mean. We understand satisfactory academic progress policies, deadlines for withdrawing, the complicated student VA funding formula, and financial aid policies so that we can assist students in making informed decisions about how to proceed when things are difficult. We can consult with instructors and advocate on students' behalf. Um, when a student is undecided about choosing a career, we offer career counseling to them. We teach first year experience and career planning courses. We work on campus committees and bridge the gap between academic and student affairs, always keeping the students at the forefront of decision making. We know that retention is in the relationships and we strive to be the student's person on campus, the person that they know they can come to no matter what is going on in their lives. This holistic model of supporting students in their mental health, career and academic counseling needs has been and continues to be the right model for our students. Although we are a system, our colleges all have local autonomy to determine how best to provide mental health services for our students. When there's a large turnover in administration, which we've seen a lot of recently and we're not alone in experiencing that, there's a lack of continuity regarding staffing for mental health services. And consequently, there's not equity among campuses in terms of the student support and the counselor student staffing ratios very widely across our system. A student who attends one campus might have a fully staffed counseling center and then they move to another campus, which we know happens, um, where there is limited or no counseling available. We're very lucky at Inver Hills. I feel very blessed to have an amazing department um, here that I, um, of colleagues that I work with um, and we have support to maintain a fully staffed counseling center. What I'm here for today is to advocate for my colleagues and students at the other Minn State colleges to have that same support in place. I am myself a product of a community college and I have been a community college counselor for my entire professional career. This is my place and these are my people. Because I've also been in leadership positions within our statewide two-year counselor group, I know many of the counselors, most of the counselors across the state working in these positions and I can honestly say that you will not find a more dedicated group of student advocates out there. If you look at the longevity of the people in these positions, you'll find that it's not unusual for a counselor to have decades of service in this role. An investment in these positions is a reciprocal investment as faculty counselors are dedicated and committed to the students and the campus and the communities we serve. We know that searching and hiring and filling positions is costly and time consuming task. We've seen some campuses try different models that have resulted in turnover and time and money spent in search processes. Focusing on a consistent, fully staffed model of faculty counselors will address the inequity of these services. With their consent, I'd like to briefly share a student, um, an example of a student that I'm currently working with and their um, circumstances. This student is a returning adult veteran who has suffered from PTSD, has significant financial concerns, a criminal record that makes career planning complicated, is in recovery, and lost their brother to suicide this past fall. As a faculty counselor, I'm able to assist the student with these issues and not send them to different offices or appointments depending on what is the most crucial or critical topic for them to discuss at any given appointment. This is an example of how this holistic model can work to provide a student with a stable professional mental health counselor and student advocate that will remain connected to them for their entire time in college. Student lives are complex. Them obtaining support should not be. By committing to fully staffed counseling centers, I believe that the stability that comes from hiring professional faculty counselors will not only serve to address the mental health crisis, but will be a fiscally responsible decision for the future, positively impacting retention for both students and the counselors that are hired. Chair Bernardi, Vice Chair Christensen, and Representative Cleveland for bringing this forward. On behalf of the Minnesota State College Counselors, I wanna thank you for your consideration, support of this bill, and for your support of our Minn State College students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Schmidt. 
Now we will have with us Axel Kylander. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Bernardi and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Axel Kylander and I'm the president of Lead MN. And if you'll allow me, I'd just like to begin by thanking Chair Tomasoni for everything he's done for students over the years and for the inspiration of his courage. Um, I can say personally that uh, the thing that reminds me of most is the courage of my mother, which is the maybe the highest praise I can give someone. But I am here today to testify in support of House File 4220 and the expansion of faculty counselors on college campuses. I have shared my personal experiences with mental health struggles with this committee before. Losing my mom to brain cancer between semesters precipitated a spiral of PTSD depression and anxiety. In the 2018-2019 school year, I spent much of my time feeling like I had one foot in the grave. I would go days without sleeping, barely able to keep my eyes open on campus, but unable to rest at night, plagued with flashbacks and hopelessness. Suicidal ideation was one of my few constants. My sense of identity was confined to my suffering, and I had no hope of ever feeling more than that pain. One of the people that helped me find hope was a faculty counselor. She helped immediately, not just by being kind, but by clearly understanding what it felt like to suffer mental illness as a student. She was embedded in the school community, teaching stress management classes or providing workshops on mental illness, even coming to events that put on by student organizations whenever she was invited. Since she was one counselor for over a thousand students, we weren't able to meet every week or do the kind of long-term work that would prove to be what I needed for a lasting recovery. But when I wasn't ready or able to access long-term treatment, my school's faculty counselor was able to help me with the kind of crisis intervention and short-term support I needed to get through my worst lows. She helped guide me through the worst of the emotional pain, helped me figure out my first steps in treating myself healthily instead of destructively, and most of all was someone I could talk to in an unfiltered way about what I was going through. When my boat was sinking, she was the person trained and equipped to bail out the water. And I believe that counselor saved my life, and I am testifying today to urge you to support House File 4220 because we need more people like her. We need counselors like her on every campus, and we need as many as possible to meet the crisis our student community is in. This is exactly the type of legislation I and students like me have hoped for for years, and we hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kylander. Appreciate uh, your testimony. Oh, and uh, you, you're sharing your story. It takes a lot of courage, and it really um, is in inspiring for others to uh, get the help they need and get through hard times. So thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Representative, uh, Representative Cleveland, do you have any other testifiers? No, Madam Chair, those are the three testifiers. Thank you. Okay, we have, we have no public testifiers. So now we'll go on for member discussion. And I see Representative uh, Erickson has her hand up. Representative Erickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I hope I'm not taking another member's question, but Representative Claiborne, I have a question for you as to why, why have you put in the uh, proposal a calculation of student population uh, as of February 1 of this year? Uh, why, why have you set that standard uh, before you uh, even make the program effective? Representative Claiborne. You know, that's a very good question, Ms. Um, Harrison. Let me look back to the appropriation. I believe the, um, you know, let me ask Mr. Grant exactly why we discussed this when we were drafting the bill. Uh, Mr. Grant, could you answer this question? Please? Mr. Grant. Of course, thank you, uh, Chair Bernardi. I believe, <clears throat> and, and you'll, um, Forgive me, but I, I believe the uh, we don't at MSCF we don't write a, a ton of legislation. Uh, but that is was an attempt to 
plant the flag at a moment in time so that uh, there wasn't, it, it, it was essentially a, a, a hold harmless or, or main, maintenance of effort uh, moving forward that we wanted to kind of plant our flag and say, this is where our counselors are now. The goal of this was not to re, as, as uh, enrollment goes up and down, it was not to, to uh, demand a, a specific ratio and then hold campuses to that to the point where they would possibly get rid of a counselor uh, if um, enrollment fluctuated in any given semester. So it was an attempt to just establish where we are at right now and build forward because our, our assertion is uh, we have campuses with working um, counselor departments now, very effective ones, and we want to build on that and address the need on, on uh, all of our campuses. Is that helpful, Representative? Representative Erickson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grant. Uh, it, it's still confusing, but um, you know that's the way it is. That's what's written in the in the proposal, and perhaps uh, there can be consideration made in regard to I think what Representative Heinzman is going to ask, and that might be about the effective date and uh, some other questions I'm sure he has. So I will just hold and uh, wait for other answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you, Representative Erickson. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Erickson's right. That's kind of where I was going and wondering because, you know, Representative Claiborne, at the at the beginning, you introduced this bill as simple and straightforward. And I'm sitting here looking at this going, um, I'm not sure what I'm missing. And I appreciated uh, Mr. Grant's comments, but you know, even when you go down to the section and make it, what is it, July? This is line 1.17. This section is effective July 1st, 2025. Are we just assuming that it's going to take that long to find counselors? I don't understand what the holdup is. And there again, I don't know if we've fully gone through why uh, in line 1.16, the number of students per full-time counselor at the campus on February 1st, 2022 is a part of that other calculation. But those things together doesn't seem at all simple and straightforward. So I'm definitely struggling. Madam Chair. With, okay, Representative Cleveland. Thank you. And I do appreciate the question. So when you're thinking about hiring and getting a school year up and running, when you know how many students you have in February, you can plan for the next coming year. That is my thought. Maybe Mr. Grant would have a different idea about that. And you are correct. There are not immediate counselors for us to say, as soon as this is uh, passed, we will be able to fill all of these positions immediately. It will take some time to get up and running. And if Mr. Grant would like to uh, address the question further, I would appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Grant. Yeah, thank you, Chair Bernardi. I, I will, and I think uh, I think Leanne may have something to say about this as well. But but if I understand it correctly, and I believe I do, uh, in order to suss out uh, ratios, you had to, again, you had to pick a moment in time where you knew what the enrollment was. And that is just our moment in time. Um, we are absolutely open to working with Minnesota State to address, uh, we believe the counselor's uh, presence on campus is the, is the standard that we should meet. We do understand that the counseling needs may be different in Minneapolis than they are in Thief River Falls. And so uh, the, the phased in approach was also so that we were not in a position to tell Minnesota State that you now need to hire 250 counselors. We believe they're out there. Uh, we absolutely believe that that uh, that um, there are professional counselors out there who meet our minimum qualifications and would uh, fit well in our campus. But the phased in approach was simply a time to work with Minnesota State as to how this is going to roll out. And uh, again, uh, Chair Bernardi, I believe um, uh, Leanne Schmidt can speak a little bit to this if that's okay. Okay, well, uh, just a, one minute here. We have um, 21 minutes left and we were gonna wrap this one up at 4.05 and I said we could go until 4.10. So we have uh, one minute left for questions because I wanna make sure that we get to um, our next bill, which is a very important bill as well. So um, I'm gonna go to Representative O'Neill and ask, uh, have her uh, pose her question and then we can come back to uh, Representative Han uh, Heinzman and Daniels at Representative Daniels at the end if we actually have more time and if you could stay around if we have if we have extra time. Representative O'Neill. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so this bill has got uh, several issues, as we pointed out. Also, it's a blank appropriation, and I don't know if the author has any idea as to how much this would cost, but um, when Mr. Graham said that he believes counselors are out there, let me just assure you that we are in a crisis across the nation with hiring. Um, I so I dip my toes in all kinds of things, including the Department of Corrections, for for example, who has they have all levels of therapists within their entire system, and they are desperate for therapists. Everyone I have talked to in the industry is desperate for counselors and therapists. They are not readily available. This is going to be a heavy, heavy lift. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do, but this this is a huge challenge. I'm not even sure how many counselors this is. It wasn't in the testimony that I heard. So there's just a lot of unanswered questions. It's not really a bill that's really ready to go. Um, it's got some problems. I understand the concept. And of course, we want students to have availability. But um, this bill's got several issues. So since we don't have much more time, I'll just leave it with that. Thank you, Madam Chair. OK, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, Representative Cleveborn, we would you like to make some closing uh, comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. And really, this bill comes uh, out of the need of students, and we do have to address the needs of students. We've heard a lot today about hope and moving people forward, and this is just one way that we can do it. And Chair Bernardi, I thank you for your work in this area as well, and for all of those who are concerned about the mental health and uh, safety of our students and their academic progress. With that, I would just ask for your uh, laying, I thank you for laying this bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you to our testifiers in the discussion. So hearing no further uh, discussion in the time allowed here, I will renew my motion that House File 14. Madam Chair. Yes, Representative, who is that, Heinzman? Yes, yeah, Representative you, Heinzman. Just a few moments ago, Madam Chair, you said that you would come back to me and then my hand remained up and you look past it apparently, or maybe it was a mistake, I don't want to assume, and then say that there's no further comments. Um, oh, Representative, excuse me, Representative Heinzman, I, I thought I, I, maybe I didn't explain myself. I said come back to after the end of our committee, if we have time to come back for further questions. No, Madam Chair, you did not explain that. You said you would come back to me. So I am, I guess. Okay, Representative Heinzman, I will that. explain it clearly now. I'm sorry if I didn't explain it before correctly. We have um, we have to move on to our next bill. We have till 430. And if we have time, I will you will be you're the first on my list that I wrote down to come back to. So with that, we are going to start our next bill out of respect for the people that are here around the state of Minnesota to um, talk about this bill. Uh, and we have on the agenda House File 4223 from Representative Keeler. We have um, the remaining time until 430. And if we wrap up sooner, which um, we'll go back to further questions um, of the last bill, we I will move that House File 4223 be laid over for possible inclusion. We have before us House File 4223. Representative Keeler, please present your bill to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'll be really quick because I think my testifiers can talk about this more appropriately. But what this bill does is one of the things we've talked about and have heard in this committee, both last session and this session, um, is the lack of support for our tribal colleges here in the state. I think we've learned the, a massive amount of work that they're doing with a very small budget. Um, and these are Minnesota students. And so uh, what this bill does is it creates an appropriation um, to help with the operating expensive expenses of tribal colleges. We've been in communication with our tribal presidents to talk about what that need looks like. Um, and, and what it comes down to is that uh, the request is 1 million per year per or per uh, tribal college. I'm not going to go into the depths of it. I'll yield the rest of my time for our testimony um, in hopes that we get through this in time and can have a robust conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Keeler. And with us is President Helen Zykina Montgomery. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Helen Zaikina Montgomery, and I am the president of Leech Lake Tribal College. Um, I'm going to take only two minutes of your time. I know we're pressed for time, and I know my colleagues um, are here with us today. 
Um, I wanted to thank you for letting me speak to you today. And I also wanted to thank you for letting me a bar, a part, be a part of the powerful testimony of the ALS bill. That was really powerful testimony and I appreciated everybody's reaction and feedback. So back to our bill. Um, I thought about what I want to say to this committee and my first instinct was to emphasize our tribal college students, but I want to mention that, you know, some time ago, I made a promise to myself to not speak about our students from a place of lacking, but rather from a place of celebration of support and success. All of our students are answers to a prayer and a dream of their ancestors and of our communities. Our students um, do and accomplish excellent things on really small budgets and facing a lot of barriers that many other students do not face. These include transportation, childcare issues, access to food, everyday goods, income issues, inequities, um, lack of jobs in our communities, and general economic depression in the, in the communities where they live. But I do want to talk about the faculty and staff at our colleges and in my at my college in particular, who make this possible for our students. Currently, our faculty and staff are paid 20 to 30,000 below the Minnesota average for comparable positions that they perform. They're 20 to 40,000 um, dollars below the national average for the positions that they perform. Our faculty and staff have never had a cost of living increase in the history of the college, not a meaningful increase. We've never had a budget to plan for that. Our students don't have a cafeteria. Our students do not have um, childcare available to them through the college. And we have never had a mental health professional who can provide mental health support to our students on the college campus. Our nation's uh, behavioral support services are overwhelmed and it would be really nice to just have somebody devoted to our students um, who can provide that service. Um, we are badly in need of new programs. We need social workers, we need early childhood educators, we need healthcare providers, we need tradespeople. We are very badly in need of new programs which we do not have the funding to start. New programs take um, money and time to start and sustain as you all know, and that has never been in our budget. So we're asking for this funding um, on behalf of all of our, our tribal colleges, but for us at the Leech Lake Tribal College and for me as the president whose job it is to watch out for my students and my employees, um, I'm asking for this funding to support the growth of our programs for our students, the growth of workforce supply and development for our community, and to be, to be able to provide an equitable and living wage for our workers who are dedicated to the success of our college. Thank you very much for your, testi for your testimony. With us now is President Anna Shepard. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Anna Shepard. I'm the interim president of White Earth Tribal and Community College. So I'm gonna to try to make this short and sweet too. Um, I would like to ask the state of Minnesota to allocate an annual $1 million to each of the Minnesota tribal colleges. I would like to request these funds to be unrestricted, which would allow for each college the flexibility to develop and expand our programs and services for the students to support the college vision and mission statements that are grounded in Anishinaabe values. The White Earth Reservation serves a large geographical area. To come to campus from Pine Point Village to Minoman, it would take you an hour and 30 minutes to travel in good weather. Not only does travel impact our students, but we have over 80% of our student body that are first generation and 75% that are Pell eligible. For first generation low income college students, being accepted into a college is a major accomplishment that opens the door to numerous possibilities. It is our responsibility to help the students navigate the higher education realm. Whiter Tribal and Community College would like to expand our associate's arts degree to an online format. First, we would need to increase our IT department, hardware and software for this new delivery mode. Eventually, we would like to continue to expand our programming offerings. A need that has been shared by the employers is to have skilled trade workers to meet, to meet the demand of the construction industry. The funds would allow us to offer the construction technology AAS degree that would entail plumbing, carpentry, electrical, HVAC construction trades, 
and we're looking at adding um, solar to this one. And we are in discussions right now with Pine Technical and Community College and Rural Renewable Energy Alliance to grow these programs. With your support of annual funding to Minnesota Tribal Colleges, you'd be able to help us meet these aspirations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And with us now is President Dan King. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record. Oh, you're, yeah, you need to unmute. President King, can you unmute? Hmm. And send po positive thoughts your way that your mute's going to come off. <laughs> Shucks. Hmm. I'm not sure. Madam Chair, I can work with President King if you want to go to questions. Okay, let's go to member questions. Uh, I see, I think I saw Representative Erickson's hand up. Yes, Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for the author of the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, Rep Representative Erickson. So Representative Keeler, um, you know, I'm grateful that we have our, our tribal nations creating colleges. I think that's just great. And I think it's very important to all the students and the community uh, that they support and that they uh, have hope for a better future. But these are non-public colleges. So does that mean that we're gonna be able to uh, take requests from our other non-public uh, institutions our private colleges, so to speak, to provide them with dollars for maintenance and operation? Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Erickson, this bill is designed to support our tribal colleges in the, in the, in the spaces that they need. Um, I think that there's options for other people to bring bills forward to support other areas of education. My concern here is that we've heard the lack of support over and over and over in this committee, both last year and this year in support of our tribal colleges. And so uh, that's where my language and that's what this bill is intended to do. Representative Erickson, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Representative Keeler, for one, they're sovereign. Uh, for another, uh, when we did this in the K-12 arena several years ago, we built in accountability and your bill has nothing but an appropriation. So it is not a good policy, nor is it good for us as a state to be not expecting accountability for these dollars that are gonna to flow to these uh, institutions that are under sovereign entities. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Representative Cleaver, no, excuse me, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Erickson, for the question. It's my understanding that we give money to the U of M and the money to Minnesota State without any um, requirements back to letting us know exactly how they're spending money. I know they show up in front of our committee and tell us what they're doing and ask for more funds, um, but would be interested to see what that language is in, in those uh, money aspects as well. Okay, Representative Madam Erickson, Chair. we have- Well, Madam okay, Chair, I... they're, they're not sovereigns though. They're into the state of Minnesota besides uh, the University of Minnesota is autonomous, and this would be even more autonomous uh, if we get involved in these kinds of uh, spending uh, programs. So I just think we need to think carefully about setting this kind of policy without accountability. Because in K-12, when we did this years ago, uh, we have gradually you know, put requirements that if state dollars are flowing to our contract schools, for example, because that's where we place our funding, there must be accountability and they have to, they have to abide by certain state regulations in our K-12 education code. It, just so you understand that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And you know, my question's uh, similar uh, along with Representative Erickson, but um, if either the author or staff could uh, just kind of clarify, I believe that this bill, sets up create creates a uh, base funding in the tails 
that sets up ongoing expenses uh, for future budgets of the legislature. And I don't think that, that we've traditionally uh, done that in this area. Um, and I'm not sure that in a policy year uh, that that's what um, I'm willing to support ongoing spending uh, where I think it's certainly, the focus should be on permanent tax reform that our economy needs so that we can uh, have jobs for people when they get out of college so that we can create an economy that continues to have uh, strong revenues to be able to fund uh, the basic needs of the state. Uh, could staff comment on that? I just wanna make sure I'm reading the language right, that this will create ongoing spending in the tails uh, of our budget, is that correct? Mr. Savory? Uh, Chair and members, yes, the, the last part of the language of the bill, uh, referring to the bill online, 1.11 um, establishes a base in FY24 and years forward. Representative Kosnick, I'm have you wrap up your question here so we can move on to our two more questions we have before the end of the committee. No, thank you, Madam Chair. And just real quick then to the author, you know, I, I get it that we have a, a significant surplus. Uh, our side of the aisle thinks it's important to provide that surplus and give it back to the taxpayers. Um, you may find a better success if it's a one-time type of an appropriation. Um, just a suggestion. I'm not sure that I would necessarily support that. Our priority is to uh, provide tax uh, surplus refunds and permanent tax reform to our taxpayers. But that would be my suggestion, but certainly cannot support ongoing uh, spending in the tails for new programs. Thank you. Uh, we have two uh, We have two further uh, questions for our members. We'll go to Representative Cleveborn and Representative O'Neill is on deck before we go back to Representative Keeler for closing comments. Representative Cleveborn. Thank you, Representative. Sorry, I meant to look, turn my camera on. Thank you, Representative Keeler, for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. Um, I am often struck by the fact that um, we speak of our tribal nations as though um, the, uh, they are separate from also being Minnesotans. Um, I uh, remember Mr. Finday testifying during redistricting that. Um, our tribal communities were here and were the first Minnesotans long before county lines existed and uh, political subdivisions existed. And I am a member of this committee who has often wondered why on earth our tribal schools are kept separate from our higher education uh, budget discussions and so for me, this is a very refreshing bill and I'm very thankful for your bringing it forward and I wholeheartedly support it. This is, uh, it is um, important that we keep all Minnesotans in the higher education uh, discussion. So whether it's our private colleges, our public institutions or our tribal colleges, they all need to be part of uh, a robust higher education community that supports the needs of Minnesotans. So thank you for bringing this legislation forward. Thank you, Representative Cleveland. And we have two minutes left in committee. And so Representative Neal gets a minute of it. Representative Keeler gets a minute of it. And um, we, um, uh, we had a great uh, testimony with Doc, uh, uh, Chair Tomasoni today. So um, we will go with Representative O'Neill now. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if Representative Keeler could explain the difference because I think the committee is a little confused. And Fond du Lac is actually tucked inside of Men's State, so they're they're different. They're still tribal, but they're different. And then these three are not out inside of the Men's State system. Uh, they are independent and sovereign. And I'm wondering if Representative Keeler could explain the difference between the two and maybe why the three have chosen to not be part of the Men's State system like Fond du Lac has. Representative Keeler. Um, I don't know that it's not that they're choosing to. It takes a lot of resources to be accredited. I think we heard from our, our presidents and over the conversations that they, they want to be to that level, but it takes resources and it takes tools to get a school to the level that they can be accredited. Fond du Lac has done an amazing job at that. Um, they've been an example of what could happen. Um, to me, it's just making sure that the three other community or tribal colleges 
in, in our communities uh, have, the, have the resources to grow and expand um, because I believe and I, and I think that uh, education, especially higher education, needs to be an opportunity for everybody and not just a privilege for some. And I think adding this money to be able to support their growth is just really important in that space because hopefully down the road, we can help them grow to an area that they could be accredited with the state. Okay, Representative O'Neill, we're at 430. Yeah, no, she said it articulate. So that is the point is I'm hoping that what the what this is, is a springboard to become like what Fond du Lac has been able to do because they are quite successful and they are tucked within the men's state system with all the accountability and audits and everything that is done. So I just wanted to point that out and I'm hoping that's the direction that we're headed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and Representative Keeler, and uh, would you like to summarize? I have not, I, yeah, we have to wrap up. And uh, if you could summarize your bill, that would be great. It's a good bill. Investing in education with our sovereign nations is something we've talked about. We know the gap areas. We know how this can grow. Our tribal leaders are in front of us asking us to partner. I want to remember that we have a $60 million ask from the Minnesota state system and a $65 million additional ask from the U to support services. Our tribal community colleges are asking for $1 million a year. Thank you. Okay, we are now over time. I will renew my motion that House File 4223 be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill is laid over. Our next meeting is Wednesday, March 16th. The meeting is adjourned.